uh, here this morning. But it's just worth knowing that, like worth knowing that we had various ones who are uh, giving us a sort of these cultural masterpieces. So Bo, I'll just give a few examples. Boethius is an example of someone who was a, he's a sixth century Roman statesman and philosopher. And if you're in graduate you know, school here or somewhere doing philosophy, maybe you've come across Boethius at a certain point. But he also, and he, so he wrote philosophy, but he also wrote works in music theory and mathematics. Uh, and apparently his manual for music theory and composition lasted as a central text for literally centuries. <laughs> Which is like if you're in the, in the uh, you know, publishing space at all, to, to have this be like the standard work for centuries is just kind of unbelievable. Um, but that's Boethius. Dante be another great example, uh, 14th century uh, figure, right? His epic poem, The Divine Comedy, is regarded as like literally one of the greatest works uh, ever, works of literature ever, right? Uh, his Divine Comedy. The Scientific Revolution. Uh, you've got Francis Bacon up there, the sort of uh, 80s rock opera hairstyle. Uh, it is uh, Robert Boyle, uh, Johannes Kepler, and Isaac Newton. Right, these are the primary figures of the scientific revolution, and they're all Christians, all avowed Christians right, in various ways. I love this. So Isaac Watts, um, his book title is one of the best book titles I'm, I'm aware of. Uh, it, it is this, Logic, or the Right Use of Reason in the Inquiry After Truth. Wait for it. It's not done yet. Uh, with a variety of rules to guard against error in the affairs of religion and human life, as well as in the sciences. Right, so just in case you leave anything out in the title, right, there you go. But, um, so he, he writes, you know, of course, we know Isaac Watts is the great hymn writer and so on, but he also writes a uh, very uh, standard, uh, uh, again, used for centuries, actually, standard logic text. Um, so there's just, right, there's an intellectual life there's an intellectual culture. Uh, Christians are valuing and uh, prioritizing in a way and living out the intellectual life, and it radically transforms and shapes culture. That's, that's, that's the claim I'm, I'm making. Oh, sorry. Uh, the universities. The, the university, you know, as we understand it, is, is essentially a Christian invention. Um, <coughs> Right, each of these, Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, Yale, and Princeton, were pretty much, I mean, they, they would probably today be called seminaries in their, when they started, uh, especially the, the U.S. Uh, uh, universities. They were, they were started to train ministers, in effect. Um, Right, but, but we've lost all that. Like, they, they were Christian. You still have them in, like, their, you know, you can see many of them where they have the... Uh, sort of cornerstone, where it might have the slogan, it's going to have still much of the sort of Christian language attached to it, right? So at some point in time, again, we, we're not going to the, the, into all the details about, um, you know, the historical side of it, but at some point in time, the church-dominated culture was a major cultural player, and then we've lost the culture. And, and I want to ask why. Right? Part, partly, I want to ask why. And these were all supposed to be lines that show up as I, as I click through, but they're all popping up. So you, know, you got the answer there. Um, right? We all, it seems to me, have to do this in some ways. Like We all have to balance in, in our pursuits uh, the life of the mind and the life of our hearts. Right? Now, uh, what, what do we mean by heart? Well, biblically, I think it means far more than just our emotions. Uh, it's actually a quite rich term throughout Scripture. Uh, sometimes the, the, the term, as I understand it, I've been told that the term can be translated as bowels instead of heart. Right? So you just think of it as like the deepest place of who you are. Um, but mind, right, is the seat of the intellect, right? So whatever we all sort of stack in over here, and for our purposes, for the most part, we're going to be thinking of emotions, because uh, those come from deep place of who we are, uh, in contrast to the mind. And I think, I mean, if I could, if I was more tech savvy, I'd have like somebody snipping the, uh, or, I'm sorry, snipping the, the the wires over here. 
uh, we've largely abandoned in the church. I mean, these are broad generalities because there's certainly exceptions. You all being an exception, being at an apologetics conference in a university setting. Some of you are grad students that are here explicitly to cultivate the life of the mind. But we're just talking broad generality of the church, right? That the church has largely abandoned the life of the mind. So when I grew up, so my growing up, I, I was in high school in the 90s, uh, high school and college in the 90s. Um, so if you kind of locate my, uh, you know, sort of cultural experience a little bit. I grew up in a very Christian setting um, experience. And I'll talk about this in the, in the session next. But, um, right, I was never challenged to ask the question, why I think Christianity is true. I was never challenged to really process through and reason through uh, the intellectual reasons for the faith. And, and, you know, I mean, there's always some intellect involved, but it was never like, hey, we should really spend our time as a youth group, spend our time as just church members or whatever the case may be, Sunday school or something, thinking through how we can connect scripture, the life of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus with the big questions of life. Like I just didn't have that experience. It was much more about purity culture and it was much more, which I'm not against at all, but right, it's much more against what you should do and shouldn't do. And hey, let's get on fire for Jesus and come on forward and give your life to him. Like, I feel like my growing up experience was really quite this, right? Um, one of the, so where, where did this happen? Well, JP and Mark Knoll and others have, have outlined when we really lost the culture, where we, where we really abandoned the mind, I guess, the life of the mind, um, right? And it's coming out of the sort of um, 18th and 19th century spiritual awakenings and, and revivals and things like that, which is such a shame, isn't it? That it's coming out of revival, it's coming out of awakenings. Uh, but the shift is very much, rather than it being a, intellectual processing through, you know, is this true? Should I believe this to be true? And so on. And it's much more of a being gripped by the emotions, um, right? And that kind of thing. Um, to this day, if a Mormon comes to your door um, and you, you really kind of get down to it, uh, they will say, you need to just read the Book of Mormon and see if you don't have a burning in the bosom. Right, which I'm never exactly sure what the bosom is. Uh, like, what does that pick out exactly? But anyway, but if it's burning, uh, if you're feeling a sensation, what? <laughs> then it's true? Like, it's crazy. It's crazy for that to be the criterion by which we decide if this uh, set of ideas is true. But I think that comes, the, Mormonism, Je Jehovah's Witness, they come right out of these awakenings directly out of this sort of from ground zero uh, in upstate New York called the burned over district because it's burned over by the Holy Spirit fire or something. I don't know. Uh, it's not, not a literal fire, but uh, right. Why? Well, because if people have come to Christ on the basis of emotions and then those emotions, what do they do? Well, it's the same things that happen in my youth group experience and retreats and so on where the whole youth group would come forward crying and confessing, and you know, uh, we would be breaking CDs at that point, or ta tapes maybe even, uh, right? That, burning them or whatever it may be. Uh, right, anybody else have that experience? Okay. Um, I don't know what you do today, like burn your iPad or something. I don't know. Um, right, and then what would happen on the ride home from the <laughs> retreat, like half of us have already violated our commitments. You know, why? Because it's just largely based on emotions and emotions are fickle things and, and, they, and they dissipate and they go away and so on. And so as they're dissipating and somebody else comes along and says, hey, there's some emotions over here. Well, you haven't come to Jesus on the basis of good reasons. It's just emotions. So emotions can kind of lead you wherever. And you have these radically different um, views. Mormonism is radically different. They will style themselves as a just another Christian denomination, but you almost couldn't have any uh, different view from historic Christianity than what Mormonism believes, right? You're going from monotheism to polytheism. Uh, 
you're going from, uh, anyway, there's just lots of ways in which Mormonism is like almost polar opposite from Christianity. But if you're not equipped to, and, and not thinking about it, if you don't have reasons to guide, then seemingly you'll accept anything, or at least could. All right, so here's my thesis. And again, this was all <laughs> meant to come up in, uh, line by line, but here we go. The thesis here is that we are called to embody, as Christians, we're called to embody a deep intellectual life in pursuit of God, and consequently to think Christianly about all of life. Right? That, that's, that's my task, is to, to lay out a case for why we should think Christianly about all of life uh, as we pursue God uh, in this intellectual way. Right? What I want to say is that, well, I'll say this here. So one, uh, there's lots of these consequences of this sort of thesis. One, I think we have to see faith and reason as compliments. Right? Compliments, not like saying nice things about uh, each other, but they go together, right? You know what I mean by that? Compliments, right? It's like peanut butter and jelly, like beautiful compliments of each other. Uh, burger and fries, beautiful compliment. Uh, coffee and donut, right? Coffee and anything else, just life, <laughs> breathing, you know. Uh, compliments. Faith and reason are compliments. They go, they, they go together, there's nothing inconsistent at all of these two. And I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. I'm happy to take that up in the Q&A. Um, but a lot of this just comes out of clearly defining what, what faith is and what reason is. And I think it's, it's definitely uh, a worry that faith being one of the most important concepts in the Christian life, and yet being one of the least I think, well understood or well defined concepts in Christian life. Uh, again, maybe not in this room, uh, maybe not in this campus, but definitely in the church broadly. Uh, faith, I think, is not well understood. And people sort of can, in a way, re react to this and say, faith and reason. I thought those were kind of like at odds, right? Or, you know, I, I call it the seesaw view of faith and reason. That as one increases, the other decreases. So the more faith you have, the less reason you have. The more reason you have, the less faith you have. And I just think that's a disaster. That is a disaster. Uh, faith and reason are complements, right? Faith, just for a quick kind of a uh, little bit slogany understanding or char character of, uh, not character, um, characterization, that's what I should say, uh, fa uh, of faith. I, I think of faith as ventured trust, ventured trust so we we trust it's it's a trust first of all it's not a belief it's not even i don't even think it's knowledge uh, it might give way to knowledge it may require some knowledge but i don't think faith itself is knowledge again happy to talk more about this in q a but um it's a trust where we entrust ourselves to something and it's a trust with some risk where we ventured ourselves right i, I love the picture of getting on an airplane that's a pretty good example of faith because, right, if it goes bad, it goes really bad. Uh, there's definitely a risk involved. And I, when I talk about this, I always apologize if anybody struggles with the fear of flying. I, I'm going to make it worse. I'm sorry. But, um, right, but we, we risk our whole lives um, in get on, getting on board. That's just what, that's, that's what faith is. Okay. I also think, of course, apologetics is crucially important. Apologetics is crucially important. So what we're doing here is crucially important to discipleship. Your entire church should be here this weekend. Uh, this, this is for everybody. This is not for grad students. This is not uh, just for the smart people and the, you know, the big brain par parishioners or whatever, like, or the pastors, the professors, right? It is for everyone. Apologetics is for everyone. Second, um, sorry, 1 Peter 3.15 doesn't designate. In fact, Peter is talking to the whole church in saying that we should be ready to give a defense for those uh, who ask questions for the hope that's within. So apologetics is important. Uh, now, I think it's primarily important in a devotional way. Again, I could say lots more about this, but I think that of apologetics should be seen primarily as a devotional pursuit. It, it has some of what I'll talk a bit more about, but um, right, we are asking the big and deep and difficult questions. Why? Is it just to convert your atheist neighbor? 
Is it just to sort of like reach, you know, so-and-so that's giving you a problem at work or in school or, or wherever? I don't think that should be our primary pursuit. I think our primary pursuit should be to know God in a deep and rich and full way so that you are asking these questions for yourself, not just so that you can sort of reach this person that you... No, I'm not saying that's bad. Like, obviously, discipleship and evangelism figures in there. But I think it's far more powerful when that comes out of this deep devotional pursuit, right? It's one thing when somebody says, hey, what about, you know, problem of evil? Uh, and you say, well, so-and-so says this and blah, blah, blah. And you just kind of so like get on your little, um, um, you know, soapbox or whatever and, and, and have your canned responses to that. It's different when you say, man, I have, I have deeply struggled. Like, talk about the struggle you've had with the problem of evil and the clarity that you now see, like that's a game changer, I think, in terms of our evangelistic pursuits. Now, I do think some of this, this should result in some of us, some of you, some of the church becoming scholars. Like that shouldn't, again, like this has been at odds for far too long, and I think that's crazy. Uh, some of you, some of us, some of the church should go to the highest levels of scholarship. And I think that's one of the beautiful things. And this was JP and, and some of the other folks at uh, Talbot where I studied. That was their vision was that, right, they would be a sending institution in a way, sending to these top research universities. So that's Paul Gould and myself and others uh, that are here even uh, were part of that. Some should also be, sco uh, sorry, should be artists. Now, I can talk more about that too, but... Um, I think there's a really intimate connection between the life of the mind and doing good art. I just think that there is, right? When we have such superficial art, um, maybe it's because there's not a deep intellectual faith. And I think that would, right? I think of the, the really amazing artists, like it has a lot to do with their ability to kind of take these amazingly rich and deep ideas and sort of embody them or... or um, you know, put them into their art. And so I do think there's a really tight connection between the life of the mind and art. And I think, again, why we've just lost the arts in some ways or abandoned the arts in some ways. I mean, if there's, there's, again, these are all complicated things, but one reason at least is because we've lost and abandoned the life of the mind. All right, let's look at this. I, gotta, uh, 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 I wanna dig into the life of Jesus though. What I wanna see is, that, what I want you to see is that, is there any better reason why we should embrace this life other than the fact that Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, embodied this? He, was, he, he is our exemplar. And every Christian believes that, right? Because what does the word Christian mean other than little Christ? And so we should embody and live out our lives at, as, with him as our exemplar in every area. That's kind of the point. But again, what's been neglected, of course, is the life of the mind. So Dallas Willard is wonderful on this, uh, sort of permeates <laughs> uh, almost all of his writings in various ways. Uh, he's a philosopher, but he, his, his pop, more popularized Christian writings are often on like spiritual formation and us growing. Again, think devotionally. Uh, and he's connecting the life of the mind to this sort of all throughout his writing. So in an essay called Jesus the Logician, uh, he says this. He says, there is in our culture an uneasy relation between Jesus and intelligence. Uh, he goes on to say, few today would, see, would have seen the words Jesus and logician put together to form a phrase or sentence unless it would be to deny any connection between them. Uh, in another, uh, in, in his book, The Divine Conspiracy, he says this, here's a profoundly significant fact. In our culture, among Christian and non-Christians alike, Jesus Christ is automatically disassociated from brilliance or intellectual capacity. I love the word brilliance here. Um, right, because it's kind of that multi-dimensional too, which um, I don't know if Willard has this in mind, but when I talk about these things, I always emphasize the brilliance of Jesus. Like, it's not just that he uh, is smart. He's smart. <laughs> but he's also, he, he speaks in these beautiful ways, like these, these clever ways. Like, it's brilliant, not just intellectually true and reasonable, but also brilliant in the uh, sort of aesthetic sense, too. 
Um, okay, Willard goes on, not one in a thousand will spontaneously think of him in conjunction, conjunction with words such as well-informed, brilliant, or smart. Okay, looking at scripture a little bit, we'll look at scripture, that's okay with, okay, I'm just kidding, uh, and I apologize, anyway, okay. Um, there's a kind of theme to Jesus's life, and of course, and, and people are kind of just generally this is, I'm going to say it in like the least intellectually sophisticated way, but like blown away uh, by Jesus, um, right? Now, is, are they blown away by the fact that he's doing miracles? Yeah, of course, right? Of course, that's who wouldn't be. But more often, if you go through the Gospels, more often they are blown away by his teaching. They are blown away by his uh, the ideas that he's sort of laying out in the ways in which he's laying them out. Uh, the word astonished comes up. All, like, it was striking to me as I was writing the book that how many times the gospels or, or people are reported to uh, be astonished by Jesus. Uh, and, and again, in a variety of ways. So are they astonished by his miracles? Yes. But more often they're astonished by his ideas and his teaching and so on. Now, part of that probably is because he's not formally trained. They're astonished because he's, he's acting as the rabbi of rabbis, um, right, in a really full sense, without the formal training of a rabbi. So that's part of it. But I think, again, uh, what we see is uh, people being astonished just by the teaching itself. So I have a few places just to sort of highlight this. Uh, Matthew 7 says, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. Because he was teaching them like one who had authority and not like their scribes. I think that's so interesting. Right? Because again, like what's this authority that he has? And it's, pro- it's got to be a very rich thing. It's, it's probably the kind of, I'm thinking of Michael Ward's talk last night, the kind of thing that's not very describable that we can't like look at, but we can ex- sort of experience um, that kind of a thing. But I got to think that, right, it has some to do with his intellectual virtue. There was a kind of authority to his teaching that it rang true in the ways in which someone who's teaching with intellectual virtue, uh, right, has that ring through. So. In Matthew 11, another place, they were afraid of him, actually, because the whole crowd was astonished by his teaching. So here we see this same idea again. Now, in looking at this, uh, how did, I mean, this is, this might, I think some of what we, some of the reasons why we don't think of Jesus this way is because we say, well, look, is he brilliant? Well, yeah, he's divinely omniscient. <laughs> he's God. So, of course, he's there's, you, in, in the Bible, in the Gospels, like, very much this is spelled out in his, like, even in his human development, uh, that he's growing in this. And we get this really extraordinary, and, and I'm not going to try to work out for you um, how that fits with divine omniscience and Jesus being God and how, how he could be de- developing in his intellectual life and so on. I won't be able to work those out probably right here, right now. Um, maybe Ryan in the back has a better sense of that, but uh, uh, we'll punt to him. But no, um, but we do get this snapshot in Luke chapter 2, which is really cool. I, I just, in, again, in writing the book, uh, this just popped out like as, as amazing. In Luke t- chapter 2, which, you know, we know the chapter well because we read it at every Christmas time <laughs> and that kind of a thing. But that's usually the first half. The second half of Luke chapter 2 is actually a snapshot of Jesus as an adolescent, right, as, as, as a 12-year-old, um, actually as a 12-year-old. And it talks about in two places in that second half of Luke 2, in verse 40 and v- verse 52, Jesus growing in wisdom. Jesus growing in wisdom. And you might say, like, what does that mean? What does that look like? Well, we get sandwiched in between there this story of Jesus and what, what it may mean for Jesus to be growing in wisdom. So you, you probably remember the story, right? Uh, uh, Jesus' family's in Jerusalem, and they, they, they're returning. They're, they're walking for some time, and they realize Jesus is not with them. 
So they hightail it back to Jerusalem looking for Jesus. They look for him for three days uh, and they find him sitting in the temple. Sorry, they find him in the temple sitting among the teachers, right? Sitting among the intellectuals, sitting among and probably the very ones that will later put him to death or, or call for his execution at least, right? And what is he doing? He's listening. I love that. 12-year-old Jesus Right? We've got, we don't have a 12-year-old right now. We've got an 11-year-old and a 13-year-old. Not doing a lot of listening. Uh, always. Uh, right? Uh, but Jesus, 12-year-old Jesus, is, is sitting with them. It's got this sort of mutuality uh, sort of picture here. Right? He's not kind of at their, fe- at their feet. He's sitting among them. It's not an actual picture, but anyway. Uh, right? Uh, he's sitting among them, and he's listening and what's he doing? He's asking them questions. Right. Um, if there's anything that I can, you know, tell my students, tell my own kids, and tell you all, is we need to, like, sit with those who have truth, those who have wisdom, sit with them, listen, which is harder than it sounds, right, sometimes for us, and ask questions. Um, and, and what it says is that they were astonished, or they were astounded, I think is how the CSB puts it. They are astounded by what Jesus said, astounded by his answers to these questions, right? He was logically astonishing, uh, and he grew in that. And how did he grow? Well, with this sort of intellectual virtue, this sort of intellectual humility, this, this listening and asking questions, I think. Is just the sort of attitude. Again, we want to be Christ followers. We want to be little Christ. Here you go. Okay, let's, let's lean in a bit further here. I want to leave plenty of time for questions. Um, now, Jesus doesn't, of course, to, Willard makes this point that Jesus doesn't teach logic or develop theories of logic. That's one reason why, you know, that might make him a little different from, say, an Aristotle or a Frege or somebody like that. He's not developing a theory of logic. Uh, rather, he uses logic with astonishing subtlety to bring understanding to those with ears to hear, which it, there's a lot in that statement, right? Because I think one thing that's, well, I'm going to say this in a minute, so uh, let me push on. Um, three ways that we're going to see Jesus's brilliance. First is that he's able to rebut challenges that come his way from the intellectual elites, by the way from the people who would be like the scholars of scholars in their, that day and time in the Jewish community. Um, Jesus' use of story, which again is really rich and lots to say about that. And then also I think it's in the depth of the gospel message, just broadly construed. Uh, the depth of his teaching, you just see his brilliance. So Matthew 22, uh, you can sort of write it down, look at it later. I, Spend some time with this passage because uh, Jesus, starting in verse 15, it's kind of a uh, uh, lineup of challengers, right? You've got the Pharisees, you've got the Sadducees, you've got the religious teachers, the religious lawyers and things, asking him question after question after question. And they're, challenge, they're challenges. They're meant to be challenges. So you might remember, you know, is it lawful to pay uh, taxes to Caesar or not. Jesus says, you got a coin. Uh, they give him a coin. They say, Who's, he says, whose picture is on here? They say Caesar's. And I always imagine him like flipping it back to them, you know, or they catch it or whatever. Uh, right. So pay, you know, give due to Caesar and give God what's due to him. Right. Lot, again, brilliant, I think. Brilliant. So like a challenge that's difficult. He doesn't seem to have any problem whatsoever. And we go through. Now the Sadducees give him this kind of elaborate argument here. Uh, it, it could be made more rigorous than this, by the way. This probably isn't exactly uh, the way I would do it if I was doing it quite rigorously, but this is good enough for our purposes. Uh, the Sadducees say, okay, assume there's such a thing as the res- resurrection of the dead, which the Sadducees did not believe in. And then they say, if there is a resurrection from the dead, then it's possible for a woman to be married to seven brothers at once. So it gives us an elaborate thought experiment where a woman is married and then the husband dies. Then she marries the brother and on and on. Right. We begin to wonder, like, what's going on with this woman? But anyway, uh, why are all her husbands dying? But uh, right. And then she dies. They all die. She dies. Now they're in eternity. 
uh, right? In the resurrection, they're going to be married to all seven. She's going to be married to all seven. That's absurd. Now, again, it's not formally absurd, but for, for, from a Jewish perspective, that would be absurd. Therefore, there's no resurrection of the dead. Now, again, we could look at this in far greater depth, but Jesus basically, again, seemingly without hesitation, what looks like a pretty hard challenge, just in part because it's so elaborate, right? You kind of have to say, okay, wait, what's happening here or whatever? Jesus has no hesitation and says, right, you just don't understand. You don't understand what heaven will be like. There won't be marriage in heaven. That makes the whole thing fall apart. Their, their challenge is duly uh, defeated. Uh, okay, just trying to boogie here a little bit because I'm going to run out of time. Uh, Jesus' use of story. Again, Luke 15 is a great example of this where uh, this is the prodigal son, parable of the prodigal son. Really, all of his parables are. What I think is interesting is that Jesus is asked, like, why do you use stories? Why do you use parables? And he says, because he's, he wants those with ears to hear and eyes to see to understand, right? What's that mean? Well, he's saying, in effect, like, he, he, he's aiming at those who have hearts that are genuinely open to these things already. Ears to hear, eyes to see. Uh, and so he, he carefully crafts the stories to sort of be meaningful and impactful to them and confounding to the rest. Already brilliant. Just that alone is, a, is brilliant. But I also think it gives way to the, uh, for us as we think about these stories, of these parables, to kind of never stop finding new and interesting insights, right? They sort of have this bottomless depth to them. And the parable of the prodigal son for me has been something that, right, I've thought about it, I've preached on it, I've, I've taught about it, I've written about it, uh, and I don't feel like I've, you know, gotten to the depths of it fully because there's so much richness to this. Now, we can, of course, overdo those things and find little details here and there that we think signify whatever. I'm not talking about that kind of a thing. I'm talking about what Jesus really did intend the story to mean, and he wonderfully wraps into it this like slam dunk on the um, Pharisees and the religious leaders, right? Because who are they? They're the elder son um, and the sinners. They were all part of his audience in Luke 15. The sinners are the prodigal son. And you have this like interesting interplay uh, where it's, it's going to be offensive to the religious leaders. Uh, this story is um, and, and again, should be quite. Uh, convicting, but are they going to catch it? No, probably not. Right? That's by design. So his brilliant use of story, I think, is where we see his brilliance as well. Okay, and we probably just have time for me to just, and I, I literally spent maybe 10 minutes just gathering either from memory or from just, you know, perusing scripture statements of Jesus that I think are deserved of at least hours and hours of our life to think about, if not, you know, longer. Uh, again, probably the sorts of things that we uh, should just spend lots and lots of time just intellectually reflecting on and thinking about um, and sort of plumbing the depths of. So I'm just going to sort of flash these up. Of course, if you want to take a picture or whatever, you're fully welcome to do that, right? But I think these are just profound statements. There's like such depth to what I'm calling his gospel message or his gospel teaching. It's, it's usually this radical inversion from what people of the day certainly thought and what we tend to think, right? You're supposed to turn the other cheek? <laughs> You're supposed to, uh, right, love your enemies? Pray for those that persecute you? Like, I mean, how transformative that would be to our culture if we took these things seriously and so on. Okay. I, I love John 17.3. I'm really interested in knowledge. Um, I do epistemology uh, in my more scholarly work. Um, right? And, I, and I've just, this verse has just always captivated me. That eternal life is, is the knowledge of God. Right. That's interesting. <laughs> That's worth thinking about. That's worth going to the depth of and so on, as, as are all of these. So. Seek first the kingdom of God. Right. So don't seek yourself first. Right. A radical inversion, radically sort of uh, anti-egoistic. No, we don't seek 
ourselves, right? This, if you've heard of the paradox of hedonism, right? When you seek your own pleasures, seek your own stuff, what happens? Miserable, <laughs> right? You don't find pleasure. In fact, you're made miserable. Uh, you find pleasure or let's say happiness in the richer sense of happiness when we seek for the other. And I think we find ultimate happiness when we seek the capital O other, God himself, right? We find full satisfaction in God and so on. First shall be last. I mean, come on. Now I realize that's Paul, not Jesus, but uh, I think that's Paul's capturing in a really powerful and profound thing. Uh, right, Jesus is teaching in a, in a sweep there. So why don't we see Jesus as intellectually brilliant? It's because I think we just don't think he speaks to that. We don't, we don't make him Lord over all, right? We don't make him Lord over all. Uh, but here's the thing. Colossians 1, it's really clear. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created, notice, through him, by him, but also for him. So he is the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega, uh, right? It's not only through him and by him, but it's also for him. It points to him, right? We need to uh, sort of subsume, uh, submit all these things under the lordship of Jesus. Why? Because in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. It's a big statement, right? Do we, do we live that out? Do we act like that? Do we think Christianly about all of the world, uh, the way in which we're called to here? Last quote, and then, oh, oh, I think we'll have a few minutes for questions. Willard said, Jesus is not just nice, he's brilliant. Again, he is the smartest man who ever lived. He is now supervising the entire course of, his, of world history while simultaneously preparing the rest of the universe for our future role in it. He always has the best information on everything. <laughs> And certainly also on the things that matter most in human life, let us now hear his teaching on one who has the good life on who is among the truly blessed. All right, thanks. Uh, let's open up to questions. We've got a mic to get it on um, the tape. I think we over here. here. Hi, hey. so I was just wondering, um, so so many of us are serving in youth ministries or maybe we serve here with like undergraduate students or different things and we know that pretty much the brain, they say that the brain's not fully developed until you're like 25. Okay. So how would you speak to like encouraging people to prioritize the life of the mind when they're like, I don't know, like 10 to 25 without like in embracing just that process while their mind is still being mm -hmm. developed and um, to like, not just, I, I don't know how to ask it, but like yeah. as your mind is still being developed, embrace that you may not understand fully now, but God really does have the answer and Jesus really is intellectually brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I think that is the time, honestly. That, that's the time in which right? We're, we're coming late to the game if, we've, if we haven't sort of embraced uh, these things at that time in our lives. And, and that would certainly be me, um, right? It was really more for me in grad school that I sort of uh, came on these things. Um, but more specifically, because I think you're asking a more specific question, I think that it is so I would highly recommend all, all of us to really like focus in on the, what's called the intellectual virtues. Um, things like intellectual humility, right? Where this would be, where we don't, we, we understand we're limited in our knowledge. We're understand, we understand that we're limited in our capabilities, our intellectual capabilities and so on. And so that therefore we, we kind of approach it virtuously, approach these questions virtuously. Um, now, there's moral virtues, but also intellectual virtues. And so things like intellectual steadfastness or intellectual courage, um, uh, curiosity. Um, now, that doesn't mean, again, that you just let these things run wild, because like any virtue, it, it ceases to be a virtue when you overdo it. So um, if you're going to have courage on the battlefield, 
so much courage that you just run out there and forget your weapon and, and whatever else. Like that's not a virtue anymore. Uh, that's become a kind of excess uh, or, or what, you know, what we call a vice. Um, same with curiosity. You can overdo that, of course. Uh, or open-mindedness is one I think we can overdo. You have to sort of do the mean. You have to hit the middle. Um, understanding that it's uh, coupled with or sort of um, formed with the rest of the intellectual virtues as well. So I would say develop all those. I think the curiosity one would be the one I would emphasize with kids because I think they already are naturally curious, right? Uh, especially as they're young. And I think that it's only adults that get bored with life <laughs> in a way. Uh, or, you know, and, you know, kids overdo the screens and overdo the entertainment, all that stuff. Like, I think it doesn't help always for their curiosity. Um, so really cultivating in kids to ask questions. And that's one thing we've, we have really tried to do with our kids. We have teenagers and preteen, so pray for us, but no. Uh, <laughs> Right, uh, we've really tried to just say like, you can ask anything. Like when we do our, you know, we try to do family devotions each night and we just encourage them to ask any question that they want to. No question is off the table. Now, if it's inappropriate, which sometimes happens, we let the little ones go and have the older ones stay, that kind of thing. But, right, we've just tried to cultivate that culture in our home because and a lot of times they don't have a question. It's not like it probably sounds better than it is. A lot of times they're just like, can we please just go? Um, we don't have any questions. Uh, but there's those moments that are just amazing when they say, well, what about this? And, and then you have this awesome conversation. And so um, sort of laying the seeds for that. And so if, if, we're, in a, if we're teachers or whatever, again, I think the same thing. Um, even in a Sunday school class or a child, you know, children's ministry class or whatever, youth group. I just think that needs to be a part of the culture is understanding that questions are okay, that there are answers to these questions, um, right? And that we're going to prioritize that. So our youth group at our church, um, we try to do that once a year where we just kind of have like, ask us anything, you know, and you get wild, wild questions. I appreciate you coming out today. Thank I was you. curious, um, as you were going through this entire thing, how do you, like, in the attempt of pursuing intellectual virtue, which you just mentioned and expanded upon, how do you not idolize the knowledge while seeking the one who knows? Like, oh, what's, the, what's the separation between looking for God for answers and then coming to him as the one? like being an answer himself. Yeah. yeah. So I think uh, it's a really good question and it's, and it's something that I probably need to be more careful in as I present on these ideas. Um, but I'm really interested in that. And in fact, that's kind of the next book project for me. That's um, nowhere near. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm just starting. Um, not going to be out for some time, but uh, trying to develop what it really truly is to know God. It really not just know about God. So the distinction sometimes made between knowledge by acquaintance and knowledge by description um, or kind of a propositional knowledge versus a relational knowledge. And I really think that the ultimate goal needs to be the relational knowledge, but understanding that sort of descriptive knowledge or propositional knowledge is important for knowing God relationally. Does that make sense? So it's kind of like, we can't know nothing about someone and be said to know them. Do you have to have an exhaustive, but, but there's lots of people that know things about someone that have never actually even met them, right? So there might be a, I don't know, Joe Biden scholar who knows every bit about his life, but has never personally met him. You might say somebody who's a friend or even a spouse or kids or whatever, like they don't know everything about him. They couldn't possibly know everything about him, uh, but they know him. And so it's interesting. Somebody could, a scholar could know more about, you know, a historical figure or, a, or you know, a figure like that than someone who actually knows them. So I think the aim is to know God in a relational acquaintance sense. Um, 
but, see, but also, priorit uh, uh, also uh, valuing knowing about God in the same way, knowing about Christ, yeah. Does that make sense? So that, that's, that's what I think we've neglected. So in our pursuit of knowing God relationally, we've kind of minimized or not valued as strongly as we, I think we should, the life of the mind to know about God and ask those deep and difficult questions and sort of gain in our propositional knowledge. Is that helpful? Okay. I can't read your, <laughs> your reaction. Okay. Hi, thank you. Yeah. Um, I have a question about academia. Okay. Um, I think when we think about like our highest level academic institutions, you know, you were saying they were Christian and it seems like now they are very much not. Yes. Um, so my question is like in that backdrop, like how do we see Christianity regaining its intellectual teeth in the world, yeah. you know, in a practical way? Cause I see, you know, like for example, somebody like Jordan Peterson getting very popular on YouTube yeah. for what he's saying about the Bible, yeah. you know, and like with the internet and with the state of academia, what do you think about that going forward? Yeah, so is the question like, how can we get back to that time in which the church was a, was a cultural player? I mean, I don't know if it's possible to like go back. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? But I think, I think okay. What, kind of what do we do about it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, okay, great. Well, <laughs> uh, do apologetics conferences. Go to PBA for your master's degree. Um, get, get a PhD. Uh, no, but, and that might not be everybody's calling. It certainly is not. It definitely is not. And I think that's totally OK. Um, it is just not in the cards for everybody, both in terms of their you know, life availability as well as their, maybe even their intellectual capability. Right? There's some people who are brilliant, but they're brilliant with their hands and can build a house and from scratch, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, but academically, it's just not their thing. And I, I say in the book that um, I think we, we have to be, one, very OK with whatever we are called to. Um, so if it's the plumber, the stay-at-home mom, or some, but you know, then there's going to be some who have the availability to do more academic work. And I think that person should. At, again, it may not be for them, it may not be their calling, but um, they should at least consider it. And again, the, the, the thing that I'm primarily addressing is where we think that's at odds in some way, that we're wasting our time by just getting a slip of paper and all this intellectual knowledge. Again, I think partly because the, as the previous question, it was sort of like, we can sometimes overdo that. And I think we certainly could, right? But I think we're hardly in danger of that in the church right now. Like, I don't see a lot of people just going off the deep end, like, just so rational, just so intellectual. Um, and, but it is possible. So, but if you have that space, if you have that availability or you, for your kids, and so this is what I was going to say. So if, if that's you that isn't called to all these things, you, you need to be encouraging others. Like teach a Sunday school class, and encourage your middle schoolers to consider going to get a PhD one day, right? That just doesn't, I never came in my Sunday school. That was never part of my church experience. Or the pastor should be saying like over and over again that we need, we need to see the university as a mission field. Uh, we need intellectual, Christian intellectuals um, who, who, Again, I think the answers are at least very, very compelling. I, of course, think they're all true. I mean, you know, I think the Christian answers are true. So we really do have a lot to say, but we, we again, traditionally, JP and uh, Mark Nolan in, in, in greater detail lay out how, right, these attacks on the church come at us and we're kind of not able to handle them. So the, the, it, these were all our options, either stop being the church, just hang it up and say, oh, I guess can't answer these objections, so I guess Christianity is false. Let's, let's go home. Or, again, it wasn't in the cards to be able to address those objections. Or we just say, ah, maybe those don't matter. Maybe the intellectual stuff doesn't matter the life of the mind, to the uh, uh, life of faith. Life of the mind doesn't matter for the life of faith and so on. And so I think we just have to reverse that. 
understanding that, no, we actually do have answers to these questions. We do have answers to, to the biggest philosophical worldview sorts of questions there are, as well as cultural and, and the rest. Um, and we can do things like highest levels of scholarship done Christianly, and we can do art done Christianly, right? Um, not superficially Christianly, but deeply Christian. Um, so yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Um, I was just gonna make a comment, but I also think it kind of can, was gonna make, it, it's sort of a response also to what you, yeah, you had please. been asking, which is what, you know, the primary way Jesus is going to build his kingdom is not necessarily going to be through Christians' intellectual um, endeavors and their discoveries and so on, because Jesus is, like when they think of people think about Jesus, who aren't Christians sometimes, you know, they say he was a great moral teacher. Mm -hmm. He wasn't a great scientific teacher or, or a philosopher necessarily. Like that's not what they naturally go to. And so I think um, as much as we are, should be concerned with developing our minds, we can always be better at being um, like Jesus in holiness and working very hard towards those yeah. ends. But um, so just a comment or thought there, but I wanted to say something that, is, that your, your talk reminded me of, which is that Jesus wasn't educated at the top institutions. And that he may, you know, yeah. he, there, there arguably has, I mean, there almost probably demonstrably, there has not been an individual in history who has been more influential than Jesus. And he did not sit at the feet of the smartest people. He, the Lord revealed himself to him and he spoke the words of the Lord and he changed the world. And, and this is the sort of, I think, um, posture that Christians should have too if they want knowledge. Shouldn't be this striving towards, you know, the prestigious institutions necessarily. Although I am definitely, you know, I want, I want that. That's the means I feel like the Lord is calling me to. Mm -hmm. But, um, but to be to strive towards whatever our calling is that the Lord may be revealing to us so that we can, you know, reap a harvest 30, 60, 100 fold, whatever the means are. And so just wanted to point, point that out as someone who, who, you know, like probably many of you, we're sitting among other people who are very brilliant and who have gone off and done brilliant things. And we're thinking, oh my gosh, like mm -hmm. what could I do? Yeah. And, uh, and you don't have to be a, you don't have to necessarily go to no. an institution to, to re be revealed very profound truths. And again, you know, an example is there's a student here at PBA who I adore. And, and I, one time he followed me while I was walking my dog here and he, and he was, and he was talking to me and he was a freshman. And I remember thinking, he was talking to me and I was like, how do you know that? <laughs> and I was just like, and he's like a very, he loves the Lord so much. And I remember thinking, what a silly kid, like following me around while I'm walking my dog, don't you have somewhere to be? And then he's starting to talk to me and I'm like, how did you know that? And it's, there, there's no other way the Lord had revealed it, to, revealed these things to him. And so I, so I think that we can count on that, count on the Lord to do that, to enable us to live out our callings, to be, you know, effective intellectuals, you know, moms, dentists, whatever. Yeah, so with the first thing you said, I, I, I'm not sure that's right, that um, living with moral virtue or living with holiness is the primary way in which, I think it sounded like you were saying that, that's the primary way that, you know, that we're going to impact people uh, with the gospel and so on. Like, there's, there's a need to preach. I mean, you know, people don't, uh, what's the Romans, is it Romans 10 or 11, where it's like the need for a preacher. Um, People need to hear, people need to have it proclaimed to them. Now, I, I hope it's been clear, and I usually do say, just so we're clear on this, I'm not saying this to the neglect of the other stuff. Like, I'm just saying, I think we've heard live this way and don't do this. And, do, like, and I'm not trying to minimize it at all. Like, a, a deep pursuit of holiness is absolutely crucial to kingdom work. Absolutely crucial. We have to have that deep commitment to holiness. But we also have to preach. And I think that's where I see us as majoring on the, um, as a church, oftentimes majoring on the moral without majoring on the, you know, intellectual thought. Sometimes undergirding that. You know, so in the book, I, I make a uh, reference to WWJD. Remember WWJD? That'd be my era again. Uh, <laughs> 
right, where we had these bracelets and it was like this worldwide phenomenon, who knows why, but for some reason it took the world by storm kind of thing. And, and it was all about like asking what would Jesus do? But what's ironic about that is that we can do the right thing for the wrong reasons. Arguably, that's what the Pharisees were all about. Like they, they, they did the right thing. They performed all these right things, but they did it out of selfishness and, and self, you know, uh, pursuits and things like that. And they never did it for the right reasons with, with humble hearts and so on. And so if we miss the ideas, I just think those need to pervade and permeate all of what we do. So it's a both and. It's a both and. It's not going to be just from living and committed to holiness, and it's not going to be just from proclaiming and having really smart arguments and so on. It's got to be that, that both and. Um, and the second thing you said was, sorry. Is that Jesus never studied under Yes. Okay. Perfect. Yes. Beautiful. Uh, I did never finish my answer. I got sidetracked in my answer. I was going to say, and, and I think this probably in somewhat maybe prompted the question, but uh, right, whatever it looks like for a stay-at-home mom or a plumber or a, a police officer or a, you know, or an academic, whatever that looks like for, for those individuals to love God with all of their minds could I tell you that? Probably not. I have some ideas. I've thought, I've thought about some. But I think that's for all of us to figure out, like, am I really intellectually pursuing God? Am I really loving God with all of my mind? Again, that's the love, the devotion uh, connected with the intellect. Um, is it going to mean a master's degree at PBA? Maybe. It's online, right? You can do it. Anyway, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, right? Is it is it going to be academic studies? Maybe or maybe not. That is just not for everybody, but that doesn't sort of let us off the hook for loving God with all of our mind. We still pursue that with all of who we are and figure out those, uh, figure out what that looks like for you to love God with all your mind. So very, if no other reason, because Jesus didn't have that formal tra training. He wasn't doing the academic studies necessarily. And yet he loved God with all of his mind. And, you know, we see that sort of intellectual brilliance. And here's the thing, we all know this, right? Some of the smartest people we know are people that have no formal training, no formal academic training. Uh, and yet they are absolutely brilliant. And they may be the wisest people we know. Like they're the people that, yeah, I've met too many academics where it's like, if I need some advice, probably not going to the academic. Um, so it's, it's ha yeah, anyway, I think that's a very good point. We good? Yeah, fine. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you.